Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for arranging the meeting and for your interest. Um, I'm sorry I only speak English, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so thank you for your patience with that. The story with the um, coming to visit Loughborough, I do get emails from people saying, can you put stack inside my system? Um, which is normally code for, please, will you do the work, as you might imagine, <laughs> including from some commercial companies. Uh, and, and you came, and we had a very interesting chat. And then a few months later, I emailed a bit nervously to see how you'd got on. And I got the reply, oh, it's working already. And that was, that was great. <laughs> so I think you folks did a really good job. Thank you very much for making the effort to do that work, because it is work. It's real work. And I'm determined that we, um, we support this, this functionality in a, in a wide range of things. So thank you. So Stack is a is really is a question type for mathematics. That's, that's my intention. I'm a mathematician and I'm uh, passionate about education and um, I want to put assessment at the heart of it. So the goals for Stack were to generate random questions. I really want the answer to have mathematical content. So that's one of the key things. And we should establish those mathematical properties. This is all about the mathematics. And then there are outcomes. So formative outcomes to help the students learn. We will record their mark. And then evaluative outcomes to do statistics on what the students have done as a group. Right? Is this question worth asking? And there's a screenshot. Uh, give an example of a function with a stationary point at x equals 2, and which is continuous but not differentiable at x equals 0. And I've typed something in. And the system says, well, it's partially correct. Your answer is differentiable at x equals 0, but should not be. And then there's a sketch, and it says, consider using your answer, and there's some partial credit. OK, so if anyone, in, if anyone here has not seen Stack before, that's what we're talking about. Okay? So it really takes a mathematical expression, and it, and it establishes the mathematical properties of that expression. So that's the point. Okay. So why, why are we using this kind of automatic assessment? Well. If you want to become an expert, a scientist, an engineer, a mathematician, you need to practice. And it's hard work. And it's not very glamorous. Okay, that's, okay, and we, it requires practice. So we need to give our students that practice. And, um, and our classes are large. So your class is 600. My class in Edinburgh is 600. That's the world we're living in. Um, and I, I really believe that feedback has the potential to help students. And we need to automate that process. So that's the kind of obvious answer. If I can write a computer program to solve a problem, then I know I have a certain kind of understanding of that problem. It's not just finding the solution, but the process. So I, I like to automate things. It's just my personal temperament. And if I'm interested in education, then can we automate some aspects of education? And if we can do that, we really have a particular kind of understanding. I think it's quite a high bar, to use an athletics uh, analogy, but there it is. So that was another motivation, a very personal one. And also, I just don't think repetitive work like marking is the best use of my time. I mean, I do want to help my students, and every student, you need to help the individual. But just sitting at home marking and marking the same thing over and over again is not the best use of my time. So that where we can automate things, we should do that. Okay, so that's sort of the reasons for using Stack. But why did I do this? What was my motivation for creating this, this software? Well, I think assessment is the most important part of education. It's the cornerstone. It's because that's what students actually do. Sure, I can give talks like this. <laughs> I can write books. I've written books and all the rest of it. I can make videos. But actually, the assessment is what the students do. And that's the key thing. And we should write assessments that are really worth teaching to, that are at exactly the right level for our students, which really challenge our students. And so that's why I got interested in education, and so what's why, why my education interest is in assessment. Why did I write this software? Well, I think as an academic community, we should take responsibility for our business. Okay? There is some very good commercial software, and I'm not anti-commercial. But if we choose to purchase things from a commercial supplier, then we lose 
control of our business. And well, <laughs> okay. And lastly, and I'm really honest about this, when I started, when I finished my PhD in 2000, I started my first job, I had a role to develop teaching. Now, if you've just finished your PhD, you have very little real teaching experience and you have to go to more senior colleagues. And so I chose online assessment because it was a way to engage senior colleagues in a real discussion. Well, why are you asking these questions? And what feedback will you give? And what do you think your students will get from this? Okay? And I still think it has some value for that. So those are the reasons I, I, I decided to do this. So what's wrong with multiple choice questions? Yeah. I mean, guessing, okay? That's one clear choice, it's guessing. Guessing and elimination. But I think in mathematics it's more serious than that. It's not just guessing and elimination, but reverse engineering. Okay? So for lots of the parts of mathematics, we, we have these methods. Um, and we have reversible methods. So there's expanding brackets and algebraic factorization. Write an expression as a single fraction, write an expression in partial fractions. Differentiate, integrate, and so on. Okay? And one direction is more difficult than the other direction. Okay? Every mathematician knows this. And so if you use a multiple choice question, students will use the direct approach. I mean, I would be very disappointed if a student asked a multiple, answered a multiple choice integration question by doing the integration. Honestly, I would be disappointed. I mean, <laughs> all right? So it doesn't really work, does it? Now, that was always my, um, uh, that was my hypothesis, and I, I, I believed that for many years. And then recently with colleagues at Loughborough, with Ian Jones at Loughborough in 2015, we did an experiment to test this hypothesis. We did an online test. We had 47 multiple choice questions and uh, some constructed response questions. So we did this with Stack. Um, because of the student group, we used factor and expand as one question, and we used solve and evaluate, so you know, verify for the second method, just because that was the group of students that we used. Uh, the, the test was part of the students' weekly quiz, because they had to do this anyway, and we asked for volunteers to be part of the study, but they had to do the quiz anyway, so we had, uh, it really didn't make any difference to them. So there were 40 questions in the study and then seven more questions because that was the right thing for the group as their weekly quiz. Uh, we took good multiple choice questions. Okay? These were tried and tested multiple choice questions and we just deleted the multiple choice options. So we know these are good questions. It's not a comparison with a poor multiple choice question. And here's the results. This corresponds exactly with what we expected. These are the success rates. So 80% of students got the right answer on the uh, expand the brackets question. And um, slightly fewer students, slightly a lower success rate with the multiple choice questions on the factor, for example. And then with the stat questions, well, here's a guessing effect. But there is a bigger gap here because they can't eliminate they can't guess, and they can't reverse engineer. So there is a main effect of format, and there's a significant format and direction interaction. Okay. So there really, is a, there really is an effect. So we need these tools for mathematical assessment. We must have tools for the subject. Okay. And <laughs> this was obvious a long time ago, right? Of course, everybody, uh, everybody knows this. Every sensitive maths teacher knows this. Um, and I wrote about this in my book. I wrote a book about computer-aided assessment that was published some years ago. And in that book, there is a chapter, a review of, of automatic assessment. And in fact, the earliest example goes back to 1968, so colleagues were using punch card computers to automatically grade their students' computer programs. Not maths, but they wrote a grader program. Okay. Um, I'm not going to review the history today, but, but please, I would really encourage you to, to look at the examples that I cite in this chapter, because I really wish I'd looked at those a long time ago. Some colleagues had some very good ideas, and software just does not survive. And it was a real challenge in doing the review to get screenshots, to find working versions of the software, 
Um, and actually, even to understand the design, just, there just wasn't a, a strong publication history for some of these things. And yet, there was really good design there, and we should remember that as a community. Um, so please, I encourage you to look at that. I wish I'd done that myself much earlier in my career, because I reinvented ideas, or people had better ideas, and, you know, that's a bit silly, really. So I thought I would just spend a few slides talking about the history. So I first came across um, a system called AIM. And it was a very basic system. It was completely standalone. And the website was organized into a hierarchy of subject, quiz, question. So this is last century, right? <laughs> um, the whole system was written in Maple. Maple was the web server. It was just Maple worksheets on the web server. Okay? That was, did everything. It did all the quiz management. Everything was written in Maple. And it worked very well. And it was very popular in the United Kingdom. And it, we used it in Birmingham for many years. For five years we used it. And it was very robust and very successful. Um, I did have a screenshot of this. Uh, we didn't have math jacks. Putting maths on the web at that stage was really difficult, and we used some software called Tech2HTML, which produced HTML tables for the equations. Right, just This is really, uh, yeah. And I was very impressed with this, and it was just what I needed for my, my goal of um, engaging colleagues through online assessment, but I was really worried that it was in Maple. And at the time, we had a site license, and Maple were very relaxed about this, um, but I could see that this was a risk. The closed source nature was a risk. Um, and if I wanted to do things nationally with, with schools or uh, a more open website, then we were going to have problems with the site license. That was clear. So in 2004, well, I released this in 2004, but I wrote, started to write my own system. And the goal was that the platform, the infrastructure, should be completely open source. So I started with Axiom and not Maxima. And I released that in 2004. And then very quickly, I changed to Maxima and used a GPL in 2005. And this was a complete standalone system, so I really did write a virtual learning environment. Usernames, passwords, everything. Um, because in 2004, 2005, there just weren't these reliable tools, actually. And uh, it wasn't clear which of the tools was going to become a winner. Moodle did exist then, but it wasn't clear that was going to be the best one. There were lots of these things. Um, but I'm not interested in maintaining usernames and passwords, right? I don't have that expertise, and I'm a mathematician. I want to teach mathematics. So I don't want to create the whole thing. You need a team of people. It's really important to have colleagues that do that for us, colleagues in learning design and so on. Um, so version 2 of Stack, we, we realized that we didn't want to create a, uh, a, a whole quiz system. And so I developed with colleagues in York something we called the remote question protocol. And the idea is that we would insert a question into a quiz structure for a learning environment. That was the goal. Um, and we developed our own web services protocol we called Opaque. And it really didn't work very well, actually. Right? It took a long time, and it wasn't reliable. Um, and it just and, and there were some design features that weren't good. It didn't integrate properly with the quiz. So we used it for many years, but it was just, dis just unsatisfying, right? It just wasn't great. I'm just honest about it. It worked, but it wasn't perfect. And so after a few years of this, the Open University in the United Kingdom um, contacted me and said, this is what we want, but it's just not right. So we need to re-engineer it, and we want it to become a bespoke question type for Moodle. And so we actually rewrote the whole thing from scratch. Um, I sat down with colleagues from the Open University. They funded a developer. I'm very grateful to them for their support. They funded a, um, a software developer. And we really rewrote nearly everything from scratch. And it didn't take that long. Once you have the design, it's not so bad. And that's what we, what we are still using. Uh, there have been lots of incremental improvements, lots of changes, including things like full support for scientific units, which I don't think other systems have. Um, and my line-by-line -line reasoning, which I'll show you, and this was quite new. Um, and then version 4 we released in uh, last year. That has the question blocks, which I'm sure people are using, and I think it's quite an exciting feature. That was developed by the colleagues in Finland. And I realized when I was preparing this talk, I have very few screenshots of all these different versions, because I always demonstrate the system live. 
And so I've been really, my complaint with the other colleagues when I wrote my book is they didn't, they didn't leave any screenshots for me. I've done the same. So please, uh, keep your favorite questions or something which is innovative or something that's very successful or important, please keep your screenshots. Because in five years' time, this software will have changed and the browser will look different and we won't be using MathJax. And then, yeah, so anyway, it's quite funny. And we have, well, in Edinburgh, we don't use either. Uh, we use a commercial system. So we link that commercial system to Moodle via the LTI protocol. And I was really nervous when I took the job in Edinburgh that I'd have to rewrite Stack again. But fortunately, in the meantime, between the remote question protocol, the, the LTI people have done a great job. And these web services protocols are really reliable. They really work well. And so it was almost no work to connect them up in Edinburgh. Um, so that's what we're using. Uh, and it's really good. And with a commercial partner, we're developing an API. And this is news. I haven't demonstrated this before. So I've uh, timed out. So let's see if I can do something very dangerous and really... Um, uh, which one is it? Oh, no, it's not that. It's this one. Okay, so... So we're developing um, a text-based question format using YAML. Okay, um, there it is. And if we just scroll down, this is, of course, APIs are never very interesting to look at, are they? Um, X squared, Let's see if this works. <coughs> there we go. Send it again. Uh, am I doing feedback? No, score. There we go. The derivative, right? So you'll be familiar with this kind of thing, right? So the APIs really is working. And the only reason I haven't really released this yet is that I'm not entirely happy with this markup language. I know once I've released it, if I change it, it will be a, a lot of work for some people, particularly the early adopters who are the people you least want to upset, right, because you put the work in. So it does exist. Please don't develop anything else similar. Uh, please, let's talk about it. And I would really need some help with designing the parser, designing the language, and so on. I would really welcome that. If people have views on this, how it works, how it should work, what you want from it, it really is working. Okay, so this is all uh, coming along. Um, we have commercial partners. There's nothing wrong with commercial partners. I think as a community, we can collaborate on the infrastructure and then use that for our own teaching. And if people want to write textbooks, there are textbooks now that have all the examples in stack. Now that's um, very happy to work with these people. This is one reason why we now have such strong support for scientific units, because they're really using it. Uh, people have already mentioned material banks. Creating this material is expensive. It's expensive in t staff time, and for most universities, staff time is the most costly thing. Um, and I think over the years, I've realized that there's no easy answer to this exchange and reuse. As a practical teacher, it takes time to look through materials and really find the questions that you want for your course. It takes time to do that. Okay? Um, so the Abacus Consortium, colleagues in Finland, every university in Finland uses Stack. Um, and they set up this consortium, Abacus, where they share materials. I'm very grateful to... Uh, Antti Rasilia, professor, uh, former, he's, he's just moved to institutions, but he was at Alto when he set this up, for setting up and running that consortium. My, my personal view on this is that the quiz level is the best unit of exchange. Individual questions are very hard to exchange, but a problem sheet that a student will do in one sitting, a weekly problem sheet, is the most sensible unit of exchange. Because then a teacher can choose everything. I want my student to do this example and this example and this example and they have a comprehensive experience of learning one small subject. And I think that's the sensible level of exchange, rather than individual question banks. So I would encourage people to, to think about that as we exchange more materials. So I think there are some key ideas that are in stack which I want to reinforce. The first one is I really try to solve problems at the mathematical level and not at the display level. Okay? So an example of that is that when you're randomly generating a polynomial, don't randomly generate the coefficients and then put the numbers into the LaTeX. Okay? Right? That's what I mean by the display level. 
So treat the polynomial as a genuine mathematical object. Right? Um, and if you're struggling with that, if there's a mathematical example and this doesn't work and you find yourself trying to do case by case, display this, display that, then email me. Right? Because I really want this to work at a mathematical level, not at a display level. This is a really hard message. Um, it's very tempting, and especially when you're busy and you've got to get your quiz ready for tomorrow. Right? I, I know that feeling. <laughs> um, but please ask me about these questions, because often the solution already exists. And if it's a sensible question you need in your class, I'm sure other teachers will need it. And if we can't do it this year, we'll certainly try and fix it for a future and really build up proper ways of dealing with these problems mathematically. Okay? So please just ask me about those things. Another key idea is to separate validity from correctness. Now, this is actually an idea that I borrowed from the AIM system. It wasn't my idea. But when it came to the multi-part question design, this has turned out to be a really important idea. It's really important from the student's perspective because they don't get penalized on a technicality. I think that was uh, colleagues in Edinburgh who used other systems got very frustrated that when it came to marking, the system had accepted the expression, but the marking algorithm didn't work very well, particularly when students use floating point numbers as a proxy for a rational number, 0.33 instead of one third. Okay, the marking algorithm stops working because it's 33 one hundredths. It's not one third. Okay? So the validity, type, the validity really stops the students being penalized on a technicality. We've just recently added features to insist on a particular number of significant figures. So the student knows what they're supposed to do, and we have enough information to make a proper judgment about whether they've done it correctly. And that's at the validation stage. And with the multi-part questions, um, this separation of validity and correctness means the logic becomes much simpler. And there is no mark this part button by design, because the logic just becomes impossible. That was a deliberate decision. And then the last key idea is this quality control, um, question tests. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. But this is becoming key for long-term quality assurance. Of course, the software will develop, and you need to be confident that your questions still work next year. Right? You, you've put this work into making high-quality questions, and you want them to keep working. So you, you need to test them automatically next year. So the question tests automatically test questions with input-output pairs. Um, I think test-driven design is, is more efficient and more robust. Right? I write my questions, and I think about what I want that to do. It gives confidence with random versions. It helps other people understand what your questions should do, and it helps long-term robustness. So let me show you what I mean by this in case uh, you're not familiar with that. So this is Moodle, and here is... Um, a question, so I'm going to click on this question tests. Th this link is not a core part of Moodle, but the Moodle people are going to implement this now for every question type, because it's so useful. So what we have here is um, a list of all the different random versions, so you can see they're all reasonably similar. There's no edge cases that are trivial or impossible. I have written some test cases that say, if the student, uh, the test cases, of course, are in terms of the random variables. That's, you have to do that. So this is, I normally use TA for teacher's answer. Okay, so, so that's the value that the system has. It's displayed that way. It's valid and it's been marked. And it scores one mark. It expects one mark. And uh, there's no feedback. If we scroll down and look at other test cases. So if we look at this test case carefully, the students missed the constant of integration. And the feedback says, you need to add a constant integration, otherwise it appears to be correct. Well done. And I've said that gets no marks. Well, as a teacher, you might disagree with that. Okay? You might want to give some partial credit. Well, that's your business. One of the reasons to have the tests and expose the tests like this is it helps teachers communicate what does this question really do. Okay? Right now, then you can see what my question does without having to read the trees or look at it. And we know next year that will still get no marks. And if it doesn't get no marks next year, for some because I've changed something, you can see that. We have a bulk testing script that will test every question when we upgrade the server. Does that make sense, what this is doing? 
and then we can check that every random version passes every test. If I run all the, ver all the random versions, okay, you can check that every random version really works before the student sees it. This is really about quality control. I know this isn't very glamorous, and it's not the first thing you want to know, but I, please, please write these tests, folks. <laughs> uh, Please, write these tests. It's exactly what the software engineers do with unit testing. It's not a new idea. Okay? But we are writing sophisticated things, and we need to use these, um, these tools from software engineering. Okay? Right, so there are some technical limits. Um, uh, and colleagues do object to this. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, so it's useless. Well, yeah, okay. Um, there are some really difficult areas. Proofs and methods, and we're really working at the final answer stage still, mostly. I know we have multi-part questions, so we can uh, create multi-part questions that lead the student through a method, and that's very valuable, but we're still not accepting a full work solution. So what can we automate? Well, the short answer is, is the student's answer some kind of mathematical expression? And can we write some computer algebra code that will establish the properties that we want? That's the short answer. Okay, that's the short answer. But this it really is non-trivial, actually. I mean, are these expressions the same? So let's have a show of hands. Who would want though? Who would want log two log x to be the same as log x squared? So hands up for yes. Hands up for no, and hands up for uh, it depends. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it? It depends. Well, right, because at some level they, they have different domains of definition, so you could legitimately argue that they are different things. So elementary teaching, even at this simple level, there are choices to be made, and as a designer I have to, I have to somehow encode that. This is what I mean about if I can write a program to do something, I understand it better. This is a a prime example. So when I'm teaching students this, and what am I going to say to them? Because I'm now much more aware of this kind of issue. And there are lots of these in elementary maths, and we're sometimes, as teachers, not honest about this kind of thing. Yep. I'm collecting examples from good textbooks where they have different decisions in different parts of the textbook. So no wonder students get confused. <laughs> so this online assessment can help us drive this argument. Okay. So this is a genuine student's comment from a few years ago. Sometimes stack seems to have issues <laughs> with answers that are essentially correct. Once I multiplied two square roots together and it said my answer was incorrect, but then I did square root times square root. That was correct. I wasted a lot of time. I thought my calculation must have been wrong and I was puzzled for a long time. I'm not surprised the student was puzzled, right? This was actually a question about domain of definition of a function, so it really did matter in this case. It wasn't just some al algebraic manipulation. It was in the, in the section of the course about domains of function. And if we're going to use this kind of software to mark exams, we have to get the maths right. Okay. This is my marking. When I get back to Edinburgh in December, I will have another pile of exam scripts. This is 600 exam scripts. I do have some colleagues to help mark this. It's not just me. Right? But this is a real problem. Um, and online exams will happen. This is going to happen. It will happen. And in fact, there are examples in Scotland, in Scottish schools. My colleague, former now retired colleague Cliff Beavers, was, was pioneering online exams last century in Scottish schools. Okay? So it's not a new idea either. Uh, and we've been uh, trying to do practice exams, mock exams for our students with Stack, and it's working very well in many ways. So I, I'm sure this will happen. And a few years ago, I did some research to look at the extent to which we could automate current exams with Stack. Let's take an existing high school paper and mark it exactly as the current exam examiner intended. So school exams uh, are well designed. They put a lot of effort into that. They have clear mark schemes because they have teams of teachers marking the students' work. And so I took school exams and, and tried to mark them. And I was persuaded to do this by uh, um, some, co some colleagues in Germany who wanted to use Stack for online exams. Really, my motivation was to try and dissuade them 
to, to persuade them that Slack was not the right tool. But actually, I was surprised because um, the, the school exams were very clear that you had to see evidence of the method in order to award the marks for accuracy. Okay? So if a student just writes the answer, they get no marks, even if it's correct. So that's the normal situation in the school exams. The, the school exams, you must see the method as well. Um, so I was quite surprised that 18% of the marks could be awarded already, even with that very strict mark scheme. If I allowed myself this uh, implication, if they get the right answer, then they get the marks, then it got up to 37%. And I really started taking this reasoning by equivalence seriously at that point, because 36% of the marks on the school exams are for this line-by-line -line reasoning. So method at school is this algebraic line-by-line <coughs> -line reasoning. It's the most important single form of reasoning for school mathematics. So I, this is when I wrote, started to write the line-by-line -line reasoning uh, input type for Stack. And this is a genuine student's work. I've asked them to solve this equation, um, and there they are. Okay? So they, um, because of the natural domain problem I've already mentioned, the system adds the natural domain. But this is the validation input type. Um, and this is the feedback. So they did get the correct answer. The correct answer is x equals 7, but you can already see the problems. The domains change here, so they can't be equivalent. The domains change here, they can't be equivalent. And somehow the student's just forgotten about this, uh, this, this one, this one uh, solution, uh, but that's the correct answer. You, this, this doesn't satisfy the original equation, so you should throw it away somehow. And the students put no logic in here, but that's typical of what we accept in school work, isn't it? Right? I mean, uh, so should we, we should really should be discussing what we want students to do uh, and how we want them to set out their work. I mean, this is working well. Uh, we have polynomials and rational expressions, plus or minus square roots, single variable inequalities, simultaneous equations, equating coefficients. We have some calculus operations. So I've exposed all my unit tests in this area. Um, where are we? Okay, so... Um, maxima is great. Having maxima means I can, it knows that uh, abstract sums really do evaluate to their value. Um, this is from a likelihood example. It knows these things are correct. You can prove the binomial theorem with stack now. Um, I've extended this to some calculus operations. So, you know, you can do line by line reasoning including calculus operations. So, this is really quite a large portion of elementary maths now. We can automatically assess line by line. Um, I haven't done the modulus function and systems of inequalities, and trig will take. Trig is going to be difficult because it requires infinite solution sets, okay? So that's a big challenge. But and when I redid the analysis this year with some Scottish exam papers, um, that shows you um, a much larger proportion. So we're getting to 36% of current school exams. Okay, so I'm confident that we could have uh, a genuine exam paper that's no different from the current exam papers. We need a better interface. That will need work. But at a mathematical level, that's fine. Okay. And this is without the calculus operations that I added after I did this research. But the line-by-line -line reasoning is only the start. We really want, I really want the nature of mathematics is proof. We want students to assess proof. Want, that's the nature of the subject. And it's kind of interesting. There are these automatic reasoning systems. Coq, for example, is probably one of the leading automatic reasoning systems. But the majority of professional mathematicians still use LaTeX. They don't use automatic reasoning systems and proof checkers, right? Anyone, if anyone disagrees with me, I'd be interested to find out. I mean, people are increasingly using these. There are journals that only accept papers that are formally verified, right? There is that part of the maths world. But by and large, people don't. They use LaTeX. So there is a disconnect at some level. Um, and if we start using these line-by-line -line reasoning systems for assessment, then um, there will be some disconnect between what we're doing at an educational level and what professional mathematicians are doing in their research papers. Does anyone remember, um, this is Babbage's analytical engine, does anyone remember why Babbage designed this computer? What was his purpose? What, why, why did he do that? Hmm? 
Hmm? Calculating, yeah, but what, what was he calculating? What, what was his, what did he, what was his vision? Does anyone remember this history? He wanted to automatically print log tables. Okay? And the complete process. He designed a printer. He didn't want people making mistakes with movable type. It wasn't just the calculation. He designed a system that would print the whole page. Right? Because there were so many mistakes in log tables. I don't think he ever really envisaged that everybody would have their own computer. He wanted to print log tables. Okay. Does anyone remember why Donald Knuth invented LaTeX? Does anyone? Yeah, to typeset his book. He explicitly set out to replicate movable type. Right? This is technology that looks backwards. Yeah? It's technology that implements current practice. Okay. Stack currently implements current practice by design. I'm trying to replicate current practice. Yeah? I know I'm doing that. Okay? I'm consciously doing that. Well, for some good reasons, we have to establish validity for this software. So if I can't do what's in a current exam, no one's going to take it seriously. That's for sure, okay? That's just the way it is. And I think once we've established that, then we can think about modest change. Do we actually want students to do these things anymore? How many people learned how to use log tables at school? Is anyone going to admit to that? Yeah, a few people, right? <laughs> Uh, my year at school was the first year, if I, if I can remember this correctly as a school child, but I believe my year at school was the first year where we had an electronic calculator. People who took the exam a year older than me had log tables. I had a calculator. Right? The world is changing. This is an ex school exercise book from Joseph Phillips. He's doing his long division by hand. He's learning to be a professional calculator. Thirty and a half pounds of tobacco cost three pounds, twelve, and a, twelve shillings, Five and a quarter pence. I didn't have pounds, shillings, and pence. Okay, this is non-decimal money. Uh, I really think we should think hard about why we're teaching students these methods. Has anyone seen photo math? The, jar, the, the Android app. You take a photograph of the equation on your phone. You just write it and take a photograph, and it gives you the work-by-work, line-by-line solution. It's not just giving you the answer, it's giving you the whole work solution. It's completely amazing. There it is. And then there are some other issues, just to challenge you a little bit. There are three big algorithms in mathematics. There's the factor algorithm, there's the integrate algorithm, and then there's the solve algorithm. Okay? They're the three difficult reversible processes, actually, that I started the talk with. Now, how do we teach integration? Integration methods, well, how do we teach factor? I think we mostly teach factor by guess and check, right? Does that, does anyone disagree with that? Do we, teach, do we teach our students a systematic algorithm for factoring expressions? For integrate, we teach 19th century ad hoc methods. This is not how a computer algebra system does it. Does it? Really? No. How many math departments teach the RASH algorithm for integration? How many, how many mathematics undergraduates learn Bookberger's algorithm? We don't in Edinburgh teach any of that stuff. We're in a really exciting period of change. It's as exciting as it was 400 years ago when John Napier invented logarithms in, Bur in, in, in Edinburgh. <coughs> Right? right. Uh, so we do, I am replicating the assessment of these 19th century methods, and yet I'm using technology that doesn't use these methods. So we're not really training the people that can maintain the current technology, are we? We're not teaching them how this new technology works. Just be a bit provocative. This, I don't know if this is a real thing. Um, 
I don't know if this is a real thing. Uh, when they invented the motor car, people were a bit worried, so they stuck a horse on the front so it would look a bit like uh, what the people were used to. So you have to do a bit of that, don't you, to get accepted. But we don't really want cars that look like that. We want, we want cars. Okay. So I think this is going to require a bit of a change in, in all of us in how we do things, and that's difficult and uncomfortable. Um, but we don't have to completely reinvent this. Now, there are some good historical precedents. This is a, um, an algebra textbook by Pell, uh, the English mathematician Pell. And he wrote, he wrote his algebra like this. He wrote it in three columns. So he numbered his equations. He has A plus B is D, A minus B is E, as in the problem, different spelling. And now he says equation 1 plus equation 2 gives us equation 3. 2A is D plus E. So is it, okay. This would be very, um, my intention is to automate this in stack. This is going to be an input type. Okay. Right. So the students can explain what they're doing as well as doing it, even though this doesn't correspond to current UK practice. But if we really want students to understand the method, because they have photo math, they don't need, the they don't need to get the answer, right? That's for sure. But if we really want them to understand the method, then we should assess that. Okay. So the constraints of the interface will focus the student's thought, and the constraints of the algebra, just as constraints of algebraic symbolism, compress things. I really, I really think there's some exciting opportunities to improve education with a better interface here. Yeah, so are there, I mean, I'm going to replicate exams, of course I am, and I'm sure many of you will as well, that's fine, right? Um, but are there alternatives? Are there really alternatives to the way we assess students? What is a modern book? There are maybe perhaps there are mastery approaches to learning where, we, where the whole course, we assess the whole course as we go along and the student has demonstrated they're competent at that. If you become a pilot, you don't do one exam at the end, do you? You, you build up your skills, you consistent, high quality performance, not just performance at the end. So uh, we have a course in Edinburgh that uh, George is one of the co-authors of, Foundation, uh, Fundamentals of Algebra and Calculus, and that is a, uh, a course which is completely in stack, and it has no exam. Right? Of course, the, da the danger and the difficulty is we don't, we don't know who's really taking the quizzes. So there are practical problems still to solve. Okay? Don't shy away from that, but there it is. So, we can largely automate the methods-based part of the course, and we can automate the methods and the assessment of the methods, okay, I think, by and large. Um, we can increasingly automate proof and reasoning, but there are these disconnects, and those are the big challenges for the future, right, and uh, that's kind of exciting. And Stack is successful, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased that I helped to create something which is useful. <laughs> right? But I really do need some help, actually. I really need help. It's too big for one person. It's too big for three people. And help at many levels. Even if you just do, do some basic evaluation of your teaching, if you help with the documentation, if you help your colleagues with their teaching, okay, help at many levels would be really, really grateful. And that's what this meeting's about. So thank you for your interest. Um, I'd like to announce another meeting next year. So probably on the 30th of April in Edinburgh, um, here's Edinburgh, um, there's the castle, there's Arthur's seat, this is the science faculty. Um, we will almost certainly have a meeting on the 29th of April, I've used this photo because I took this photo on the 29th of April this year. Um, on the 29th of April we are planning an education research meeting, a practical meeting for colleagues who teach mathematics putting educational and psychological research into practice in your classroom. Okay? So that's probably going to happen on the 29th of April, and then on the next day we will probably have a stack users meeting because it makes sense to, to have meetings on adjacent days. If you're coming, you're welcome to both. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you very much.